Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Brooks, the Educational Services Librarian at South Central Regional Library Council in Ithaca, New York. Welcome to the Hospital Libraries Challenges and Opportunities webinar. There will be one hour of MLA CE credit for today's webinar, and we'll be sending out the certificate and the evaluation for the webinar later today. And now I would like to introduce Heather Holmes. She is the clinical informationist for SUMA Health Systems, Akron City, and St. Thomas Hospitals in Akron, Ohio. So good afternoon, Heather. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm happy to be here with you guys. Um, I've given this presentation a couple times, and it's always a little bit different each time. So if you've sat in on it before, um, hopefully you'll get different information this time. Um, I'm, I'm getting some feedback from somebody. Is I just don't, don't want my voice to be, um, yeah, just please make sure you're muted. Um, so thanks to the South Central Regional Library Council for inviting me to do this um, and for securing the CE for us. I think that's an important part of um, this presentation, especially with li uh, hospital librarians. Um, so thanks, Jessica, for taking care of that. You're welcome. Um, I don't have anything to disclaim in terms of um, financial anything that will influence what I'm going to talk to you about today other than I am getting a speaker fee for uh, for my time with you today so but otherwise I don't have anything uh, to disclaim so the big buzz right now in hospitals and actually everywhere I think is about the Affordable Care Act um, and in fact, just a couple weeks ago, well, I guess it's been a month ago now, I'm so confused because MLA took a week of my life away. Um, in Philadelphia, there was a symposium that was sponsored by um, the NNLM South Central Region, or no, I'm lying, um, the Mid-Atlantic Region, I'm sorry. And um, it was a day-long symposium on the Affordable Care Act, and I don't know if any of you attended that, but it was actually a pretty good presentation. Um, they went over, you know, what the Affordable Care Act is about and implications for libraries therein and librarians, um, you know, in particular into how we can help and things that we're going to be asked. Um, a lot of that symposium was really, I felt, directed toward public libraries and people who interact more with um, maybe do uh, consumer health education or, you know, more interaction with patients. But regardless, it was a really good thing. So. Um, Hopefully some of you guys were able to attend that. If not, we'll, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit here. So, you know, the, the intention of the Affordable Care Act is threefold. It was to improve access to care for everybody, to reduce costs and improve quality, which all sounds very hard to do, but it sounds like, you know, this what we're doing every day in hospitals, anyhow, doing more with less. Um, and hospitals are required to be in compliance with the Affordable Care Act um, to avoid penalties and to make sure they get the maximum reimbursement back from the insurance companies, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but at the same time, they have to increase patient satisfaction. And if, if you've ever been a patient in the hospital, oftentimes afterward you'll get a follow-up survey that asks your um, you know, your opinions on your care and were you treated well and so forth. Um, those really, really play into this. Uh, I mean, they always mattered, but they matter even more now. And if the hospitals are not being rated like a 9 or 10, they're getting penalized. So, you know, I mean, it's important for you to be honest when you're filling those surveys out, but at the same time, it, it really kind of stinks for the hospitals because if you know, somebody is just mad because their lunch came late or something, and they, they might get dinged on that. Um, so, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily the best way or, you know, aspect of measuring things, but, but it does play into it. Um, and hospital administrators are obviously under enormous pressure to try to make all these things happen. Um, it, basically, I like to think of it as what, what we've been doing, really, doing a whole lot more with a whole lot less and still trying to make everybody happy and, in fact, happier than they were beforehand, which, as you all know, I guarantee, um, is very, very hard to do. So as a librarian and thinking of your library, 
who who is your audience? Um, who, you know, when we're thinking about the challenges and opportunities that we face, who who is the audience that you're um, reflecting on when you're trying to make sure you're doing the best that you can? Is it your administration? Is it the nursing staff, medical staff, other you know um, physical therapy, speech therapy, and so forth? Students, are you a teaching hospital? Do you have um, medical or nursing students that come through? Do you have residents that you work with? Um, and thinking of that and who your audience is, how does that affect, or how does their role be affected by what the ACA is asking? And in turn, how is that going to help you address their needs better? Um, I think you know when you're helping or providing service to someone, and kind of keep that in mind and even as part of your reference interview it's I think it's okay to ask you know is this a new thing that you're being asked to do get a little bit of background information from them um, why are you asking this question you know, not with being prying but I think you understand what I mean you know is this something new that we're gonna have to be aware of that other physicians might come in and ask me about or other nurse leaders are going to care about um, you know help me understand what this has to do with changes that are happening under the Affordable Care Act, because um, I think that's only going to help you in the long run, too. So once you have your audience figured out, how do you define your value to them and the library to them? The library, is it a cost center or is it a cost saver? My own library, we have consistently been a cost center. We don't make any money for the hospital as far as the, you know, the four walls of my library are concerned. Uh, but I think we do a lot to s make cost savings throughout the hospital. My job is to define that value and put it out there so that when the administrators come knocking and say, hey, how are you saving the hospital money or I'm closing the library, what can you do to automatic, you know, automatically tell them, this is what I'm doing to save you money. One of the things to keep in mind is, you know, to tell them, hey, we're part of a consortium. And in order to be part of the consortium, it requires a librarian, so you have to keep me. And the consortiums allow us to buy into products at a greatly reduced price than if we would buy things individually. So there I am saving you money. Um, other things that consortiums do for you in terms of even like what we're doing today, professional development, stuff like that, that are all going to help you do your job better, which are ultimately going to end up saving the institution money. Um, and I, I might be wrong, but I don't know of any consortiums that are library related that don't require a library and actually be on the staff. So that right there is a big selling point. Um, you know, the other area of expertise that you have is you're, you're the best person in the institution at vetting resources and being able to say if they're if it's quality information that your people are using to make patient care better. Um, I, you know, I mean, we probably all hate to admit this, I know I do, but we, we can't help it that our people, either our patients and or our physicians, our care providers, they use Google, they use Wikipedia. Um, your job is to help them, you know, find other resources that they can use to make sure that they're providing the best patient care and provide them to them because uh, you probably can't say this necessarily to your CEO, but you might want to say something along the lines of, you know, if your mother was in the hospital, do you want the doctor using Wikipedia or do you want something that I can assure you is, you know, top of the line evidence-based medicine products or resources or whatever? Um, you as the librarian are the expert at that. Nobody else is. You are a time saver and saving time saves money. Uh, this, you know, I'm preaching to the choir with this one, I know, and I know how busy we all are because we're forever being asked to do searches and uh, critically appraise articles for the people who are asking for them, provide uh, other resources in terms of, um, you know, switching from paper books to e-books, print journals to e-journals, things like that, all things that you're doing to save time for those who are actually providing the patient care. Um, and then community benefit is a big one too, especially you know if you can, um, if you're in a nonprofit hospital, if you can some way work in patient education with what you're doing. We here don't have a separate consumer health library, 
and my library is not open to the public. But I do what I can when I'm working with my physicians to make sure they know about patient education resources that are available. Um, I pretty much live and breathe Medline Plus. I'm constantly selling that as a resource for doctors to use, you know, or even our nurses. When you're discharging a patient from the hospital or in your outpatient clinic or whatever, send them out with something that has MedlinePlus.gov on it. It's free, it's our tax dollars at work, and you're helping your patients by doing that. Um, other things that you can do for community benefit, partner with a public library. Um, you know, they almost certainly have a health or science medical type division. Um, you may be able to do something with the library to set up, um, or even with your city, uh, you know, a public health day where you could be part of that and providing resources and so forth. Um, the other thing with defining value is to consider the mission of your hospital and the library's mission, if you have one. Um, if you don't have a mission statement for your library, I suggest that you do um, because that's another thing that you can you know, use as collateral when you're talking about what the library does and what its value is. Our purpose is in alignment with what the hospital is doing. Um, but, you know, if you have one now, take a look at it and see if it aligns not only with the hospital's mission, but also with what's being asked of the Affordable Care Act. Um, you may have to rewrite it, and that's okay. You know, I, we want to stay current. Um, and I'll talk about it here in a minute, but there's also a resource on the MLA website that you can use um, in the vital pathways area, which again I'll talk about in a little while, but there's a white paper in there that discuss the myths and truths of libraries and addresses the, you know, how you respond to the question of, well, everything is free online, so why do we need you? Why do we need the library? You know, this paper does a really good job of telling you about that, but also, you know, this is where you can come in and say, well, that's not really true, and it's used might think something is free to you, but that's because we're buying it as part of our consortium and you don't even know that it's um, something that the library is actually providing, which I think is a struggle that a lot of us are having, um, which again I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, another thing with defining your value is you have to keep up with the rapid growth of our institutions. Um, I think it's very common now for hospitals to either buy or be bought, depending on their size, um, and sometimes that happens very rapidly. Um, keeping up with the rapid growth of things means more people, which means more people with access, or people that need access, and different people who need access to different things. You know, maybe you acquire a new hospital that has a focus on orthopedics when that hasn't been something that's been of relevance to you thus far, um, now you're going to have to provide orthopedic or have orthopedic resources available. Somebody is, that's an expert is going to have to do that, and that's you as the librarian. Um, the other things that come up with this is sometimes there's different IP addresses on different campuses. I can tell you from personal experience that is a nightmare, um, trying to make sure places all have access to something that comes out of uh, one central budget under one central institutional name, but a different campus is on a different IP. You know, what do you do then? We have to work closely with our IT people, um, which can sometimes be a challenge. I find that working with them um, is a lot better these days than it used to be. Um, and working with them and really trying to explain that the purpose of the hospital is to provide, or of the purpose of the library, is to provide information. It doesn't matter if it's a public library, your medical library, whatever. You exist so that users can access information. And if things are locked down, they can't get to it. Now, in a hospital, I respect and appreciate that we often have to um, have resources more locked down than the public library or our academic counterparts. But, you know, you kind of have to work with the other departments and so forth 
to come to a mutual agreement. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be exactly what you want, but you know it requires cooperation. Um, so these are things to really think about when you're defining your value. So what needs to change with the Affordable Care Act, with defining value, with what's being asked of us from our administration? It might be you. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of traditional things that are still going on in libraries. I personally think that we are really getting away from that, and especially as hospital librarians, I think it's very important that we change our definition. Um, I know that this upsets a lot of people, but it's how I feel, and I feel very strongly about it. It's worked for me. It might not work for you, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. Um, you know, you have to make sure that the hospital knows that you exist and what it is that you're doing. If you're sitting in the library behind a desk waiting for somebody to call or come in, that's not defining value. That's not being of any benefit to the hospital because many of them probably don't even know that you exist or that the library even exists. I can't tell you how many people walk into my library and say, wow, I didn't even know this was here. This is a really nice space. Really? Thanks. You know. Um, so self-promotion is important. Make sure that everybody knows your expertise, that the innovation that's going on in the library, how you can help with patient safety, how you can help with help, um, health literacy. Be part of committees, um, you know, continuing medical education, IRBs, patient safety, nursing research. You know, there's lots of areas that you can get involved and make an impact. And just by your presence of being there reminds everybody that the library is important. Um, publish an in-house newsletter. I, that's a time-consuming thing, I know. If any of you have one, that's fantastic. Um, I actually would like to hear from you and know what you're doing and how you're doing it and what sort of things you're putting in it. Something I've wanted to do for years but have not had the time to sit down and actually develop it. Uh, I have really good intentions, but nothing has come out of it yet. Um, and, you know, just within, if the library doesn't have a newsletter, your institution probably does. Um, so, you know, contact your media folks who are responsible for that and say, hey, do you mind if I write a column about some new resource that we've added or just to talk about what the library is in general? Um, I'm sure they would welcome the opportunity to have something fill in some space that they don't have space, you know, something to go in otherwise. Um, and it's another way to get your, your stuff out there. And, you know, you have to sell yourself to the administration. Um, and when you're talking to them, it's important to be proactive, not defensive, which is very hard for me. I'm not going to lie. I tend to be like, of course you need me. You know, this is what I do. Blah, blah, blah. And that doesn't work, especially when you're trying to keep your job. Um, so it's what I think of as going into, into Steve Jobs mode. And if you ever watched any of um, the releases when Apple, you know, puts out a new product, when Steve was still alive and giving the presentations. He didn't have to sell you the product. All he did was make you think that you needed it. Um, he made very brief but bold statements, took a simple idea, and made it into something very sexy. And everybody, including myself, bought into this idea. And you know, Apple has essentially taken over the world at this point. Um, but he, he was not a salesman. He just was very good at making you think you needed something. Um, and there's, there's lots of literature out there on this about how he was such an effective communicator um, that I think is pretty interesting to look into. Um, you know, a simple thing that you can do with your administration is, you know, again, make them think that they need you. Uh, Find out about subscriptions across your institution that are being duplicated. You know, we have a copy of New England Journal of Medicine in the library. Somebody else might be getting it individually within their department or so forth. You know, you can cut that out. You can find out, um, depending on how your finance system works, you may be able to contact them and just be like, can you provide me a list of all of the subscriptions that are being paid for by the hospital? 
and go through there and look to see what sort of duplication there is. You can cut out a lot of expense that way. You know, the library probably will still have the expense, um, but maybe not. You know, you might find that this is a resource that's being used much more within a small population than what, you know, um, the library is providing or having for, um, it for. And sometimes you can actually work out, uh, not very often, but sometimes you can work out uh, pricing negotiation with the vendors and say, you know, there's, yes, I have 10,000 employees in my hospital, but there are five people who are using this resource. You know, I, I can't pay the full institutional fee on it. What can we, you know, come up with? Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, two, S subscriptions. I mean, that's, that would actually, I say it's a simple idea because I think it is. Actually putting it into proce uh, process would be a lot of work and I respect that, but maybe get a volunteer to help with it. Um, and, you know, another thing about getting out of the library is you're probably finding less foot traffic. Fewer people are coming in to pull books off the shelf or to pull journals. This is because we're making things available electronically, which is what we want to do because, again, we're saving time, which in turn saves money. But like I said earlier, sometimes people are using library resources and don't even realize that it's actually the library that's providing it for them. Um, and, you know, I, I think you are living under a rock if you don't realize that the younger people who are coming in are doing almost everything on their mobile devices. So they don't need to come into the library so much, um, at least my library. They'll come in to use our meeting rooms, or every once in a while they'll come in to use the computers. But it's far less than it was um, even, even five years ago, but definitely 10 years ago. So how are these people going to know what it is that the library is doing or is providing for them? That's why I feel it's really important for you to get out there and be part of the hospital community. You, you know, you might not be able to do daily inpatient rounds or something like that, but even if you can work out a way to go to, like I said, committee meetings or um, grand rounds once a week or a tumor board or something where you can make yourself known and what you can do for the audience there. That's going to help definitely remind them of what you're providing for them and what you can do for them otherwise. Other ways to get the word out, publish. Publish things in-house like I talked about a few minutes ago. You can publish outside of JMLA if you've done some really cool projects but maybe doesn't speak to the library community. Still, publish it. Publish inside the clinical literature. Um, if you are able to get co-authorship with somebody, with one of your physicians or nurses or whatever, that's fantastic. Um, that's definitely a boost for you. It's a boost for your system, you know, the hospital. You can say, hey, look, you know, this is things that I've done that have helped within uh, the four walls of the hospital here. Um, the other things you can do is even guests post on a blog or start your own blog. Um, I think you all probably know Michelle Kraft is the new president of MLA, which means for the next couple years her life is completely different than it has been. Um, <coughs> excuse me, she's definitely going to keep up her crafty librarian blog, but she's also going to be looking for people to do guest posts and things like that. So if you've had a neat experience or something that you think is um, worth sharing with others, contact Michelle. I think she will probably do cartwheels if you say, hey, can I guest post on your blog? But that's absolutely a way to get things out there. Um, and, you know, you can write up an assessment of a new program or a new purchase or something like that. Um, measure and document outcomes of everything that you do. And anything that you have a measurable outcome on is something that you can publish. Um, I teach research for hospital librarians too and that's something I, I really encourage you to do and consider a research project actually. You know anything that you've been able to measure, you know you put pens and pencils out on your 
counter when you first walk into the library? Are more people taking pens or pencils? That's, you know, that's something that you can measure. Um, that's sort of a ridiculous suggestion, but I think you understand what I'm saying. You'll get an outcome from that, and it's something that will help you make a better decision in the future. You know what? Everybody wanted pens, so I don't need to buy the pencils anymore. Um, and I, I also feel that it's really, 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 really important to share negative experiences. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough, how strongly I feel about it, because if something doesn't work for you, chances are it won't work for me or for somebody else. However, I might be able to take a look at what you did and apply it differently in my own setting and try it and see if it works. Um, but at the same time, if it didn't work for you and, <coughs> excuse me, if it's not going to work for me, I'm not going to waste my time trying to do something that I already know somebody else did that didn't work. Excuse me for a second. Sorry. Um, and this is something I uh, even do with my residents and physicians when they're calling me and asking me for help with a search. I make them tell me what they already did and what didn't work so that when I go in and do the search, I'm not going to repeat the same mistakes that they did. I also do this kind of to cheat and make sure that they've actually tried on their own first, but they don't know that. Um, but I, the point's the same. I think, you know, I don't want to waste my time doing something that already didn't work. So tell me about it. Tell me what you did that, that didn't work out. Um, and the other place that you can share things is on Thursday nights um, at 9 Eastern on Twitter, there's the MedLive chat. Um, you don't necessarily have to participate in. You can just watch all of the um, past events or past sessions have been recorded. Um, so you can go and read the transcript at any time. Um, it's a good way to network over the internet that you kind of get a feel for other people, what they're doing. You can ask questions. Um, if you are so inclined, you can host one of the weeks. Um, we're always looking for different ideas and things to get out there and have a discussion about. And quite honestly, hospital librarians don't participate nearly as much as the academic folks. And I, as a hospital librarian, would like to see that change. So if you're interested in participating in that, um, send me a note and I can provide you uh, more information on it. But otherwise, you can just hop on Twitter on Thursday nights and follow the hashtag and kind of see what's going on. Um, another thing that I'm doing that I don't have the details worked out on yet, but through, I think it's going to happen through the research section of MLA, I'm going to make an outlet that's really intended for anybody, but I really want to focus on hospital librarians who are doing research and as a place to share their their experience without necessarily having to go through the full publish, write an article type thing. Um, I don't know if it's going to be like a blog or an online, I don't want to say journal, but publication. I don't know. I'm still working out the details on this, but I want to have a place where you can write up and share something that you did that was either very successful or a huge failure just to get it out there, to share what it is that you've been doing. Um, once I get more detail on how that's going to work, I will send an email to Jessica, who can distribute it to, um, to the participants today. And hopefully I can get something going soon. I actually wanted to have it done by MLA, but that didn't work. So I'm optimistic that by the end of the summer, I'll be able to have something set up where if you want to write up and tell us what you did, that would be my most favorite thing in the world. Another thing right now that is big in the hospital world is Lean Six Sigma. Uh, I don't know if any of your institutions are participating in this, and if so, if you've been involved in it. Um, but it's, it's really, really taking over healthcare now. Um, it kind of got a slow start in healthcare to begin with in that um, a previous place that I worked in 
I think I was there in 2000, um, was one of the first healthcare institutions to kind of buy into the Six Sigma idea. And there, you know, there was a lot of joking at the time about everybody, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid and so forth. Um, but it works. And if you have the opportunity, get involved in it. Take the classes. Get, <coughs> excuse me, a yellow belt, which is kind of the um, first step. I th actually, I think there's a white belt, but you can skip the white belt and go to the yellow, where you learn about the basic principles behind Lean Six Sigma. Um, and actually, just if you don't know, Lean and Six Sigma are two different things, but they've been brought together uh, to form one overall um, process that really, like I said, is just really working well. Um, two of the main things that you will learn when you first get started in it is the DMAIC, which is a way to, it's a data-driven improvement cycle, um, which is used to improve or optimize processes. Um, Essentially, it's efficient ways to do more with less. Um, this, you know, like I said, is really big about, among the administrative people out there. Um, and if you can get involved, again, that's another place where you can get in there and sell yourself and the library. But it's also, I think, going to be very helpful to you to think about ways within the library that you can streamline processes. Um, there are things that many of us do because that's how they've been done forever. Um, we haven't had to change them. Uh, you know, I, that probably sounds familiar to, to more than one of us. Uh, I think that's changing, especially in light of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so you can work on things and take a look around, work with your uh, the people, the quality improvement people who are leading the Six Sigma within your institution and find things within the library that can be streamlined. Um, not only will this make things easier for you, um, it'll, it'll appease the administration people also. Um, one of the other things is the 5S, which stands for sort, simplify, um, sometimes simplify is systematize or set in order, regardless, they all start with S's. Um, sort, simplify, shine, standardize, and sustain. And in healthcare, we actually add a sixth S onto this, which is safety. Um, and this is, it describes how to organize a workspace for efficiency um, by identifying stuff that you're using, making the area um, nice and clean and easy to get through, and then sustaining that new order, which is the hard thing. In healthcare, when you consider patient safety in with this, um, it makes a really big difference. And as a librarian, you know, you might not necessarily be involved in the patient safety end of it, but just something like, I, I am so guilty of this. My email inbox has right now like almost 2,000 messages in the inbox simply because I don't hit delete. Um, I just scroll past things that I do or don't need, and then they just stay there. And then I'll get a message that your mailbox is too full. I have to go in and clean it out. So I've been more efficient in terms of, I turned this into a, um, a success project, actually, in that I went through my email, got rid of things that I did not need, and things that I needed to keep or follow up on or whatever, I put into a folder. So my inbox usually is nice and clean and organized and I can get to things very easily and not have to filter through the whole thing if I'm looking for a message that I got from somebody three weeks ago. Um, and that actually counts as one of the projects that I had to do toward my yellow belt. So simple things like that, but it just, you know, might be something that you hadn't thought about before, but that is just going to um, make your workflow more efficient. Same thing with organizing your office. Um, Again, I'm super guilty of this. In fact, right now, if you saw my office, you would be like, I can't even believe you're a librarian because you're so disorganized. Um, I, I have lots of paper in my office, um, but I've been diligently working 
to make things more organized. You know, we have a million file folders around here that are just sitting in the cupboard waiting to be used. So I'm making use of them and things that I need to keep, I'm filing, filing appropriately, keeping them, putting them in the file cabinet, knowing where they are, um, which, I mean, it's a little bit embarrassing for me as a librarian to think that I'm having to do this, which is my workspace, because this is what we do. <coughs> Excuse me, we sort things. We make them available, easy to find. This is, you know, the, the whole concept behind cataloging and classification. Make things easy to find, and yet my world is very much not like that of a library. So I'm working hard to improve that and apply these 6S um, principles into my daily workflow. Other things you can do actually within the library um, with the DMAIC, look at ways to um, make things more simple in terms of um, how to, a process for checking out books after hours. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things you can do. If you have Six Sigma within your institution and haven't been involved, talk to, your, talk to the people who are leading it. And even before you take one of the classes, ask them to come by the library and just kind of take a walk around with you. Um, I think you'll find a, you know, a lot of benefit can come out of that. Um, and if you have the opportunity to take the classes, absolutely do it. Um, and if you can't do it within your institution, you know, maybe check other places in the area. Or you can do it online, too. Of course, it costs money. But um, I think you get the point that I, I feel very strongly about this. And in the world that we're living in, in the hospitals, you don't really have a choice but to apply these principles. You know, you really have to find efficient ways to do more with less, whatever that might be. So challenges that we face as hospital librarians, um, and our, our academic counterparts will say that they have all these same problems, and I'm sure that they do. Uh, I, don't, I don't discount that at all, but I think in hospitals, it's, it's a different kind of challenge because pretty much every day we're fighting to stay alive and keep our doors open. Um, I mean, you can't deny it, hospital libraries are closing every day. Not as much the case in our academic setting. So, it, you know, it's a little frustrating to me when I have colleagues say, well, I have that same problem. Well, maybe you do, but I don't think it's the same as mine. Um, a lot of hospital librarians are solo. They're the only person in there. So I get a lot of questions about um, somebody wants to start doing rounding or attending uh, tumor board each week or something, but how do I do that? I can't leave the library. Yes, you can. You can, you can leave the library. We've already established, I think, that um, you're not getting as much foot traffic as you once did. Um, and get a pager. Um, my hospital still provides pagers. I think most actually still do. Um, it's one way that we're still living in 1993, I think. Um, but regardless, you know, get a pager or find out what the communication method is for the physicians or whatever it is that they're using and get one so that if you're not in the library, you can still be reached. Um, the other thing, get a volunteer. Uh, hospitals are crawling with volunteers. And I almost guarantee that if you get in there and talk with them, you'll find one who either was a librarian or worked in the library for years. They love to come work in the library. Um, and even if they don't have library experience, you can still find people who have really good organizational skills, or really good customer service skills. Um, a library, or excuse me, volunteers here at SUMA are invaluable. And boy, if you ever want to know anything that's going on in the institution, talk with the volunteers because they they have all the inside dirt. Um, and these things are true from um, not only solo librarians but part-time librarians too. You know, you only work three days a week or you only work eight to 12 each day or whatever. The same types of things can be done. You know, get a volunteer in there who can help the times when you're not able to be there. Um, even if they're just, um, you know, checking your dock line for you or something. That's something that's saving you time. Um, and you can actually work this into a Six Sigma project also because you're streamlining a process. Um, they can do lots of things for you. So I 
I, I like volunteers, and they're free. Um, like I said, get a pager, find out what it is that other people in the hospital are using when they need to be reached um, and aren't next to a phone <clears throat> or a computer. Um, and funding is another thing that I get a lot of questions about. There's a lot of money out there to do things. Um, you can apply for grants and other awards from your uh, regional uh, NNLM office through MLA. Um, sometimes vendors have money available for things. Um, it's, there's money out there. You just have to look for it. Um, in fact, the, the symposium that I mentioned earlier that I went to in Philadelphia, I was able to get that completely funded by uh, my region, the, the greater Midwest region. They gave me a professional development award to go. So I was able to go to Philadelphia, attend the, the meeting, get all this information and knowledge and networking, and it didn't cost me a cent out of pocket. Um, so, you know, check to see what's out there. There's, there's definitely money, and a lot of times it goes unspent. So I think um, uh, our, especially our regional medical library offices would really um, like to see more interaction on that. So, so check it out, see what's in there. Talk with your other colleagues about how they've been able to fund something. Um, you probably can't get money to help pay for your Elsevier subscriptions. I'm sorry, I don't have any suggestions for that. But, um, you know, there is money out there for, for other things. So um, here's the link for the vital pathways for hospital librarians through MLA. Um, this page takes you to a link to the white paper that I talked about earlier on the myths and truths of libraries. Um, and the original Rochester study that was done by Joanne Marshall um, is in there. And then they've revamped this and done the value study, which is a newer version of it um, that you know is basically about hospital libraries. Um, both of those are linked in there. The values too, I think the newest thing that the hospital library section within MLA has worked on is um, available in there also. Um, there's some other good things that, some of it's a little bit dated, but still really, really relevant. In fact, this, um, this white paper that I've mentioned, I, um, I think it was written, gosh, I'm not even gonna guess, but well over 10 years ago, possibly 20 years ago but everything in it is still very relevant. And I actually contacted the author of it not long ago because I was using it, I wanted to use it in a um, in-person class that I was teaching and she gave me permission to do so. We talked about it a little bit, of, you know, how relevant it still is. Um, so go in and check it out. Um, look at the other stuff within the Vital Pathways. Um, I, you know, Maybe you guys all already know about this, but I find a lot of a lot of hospital librarians that I talk to aren't aware of what's in there. Um, and on the new MLA site, they've actually done a really good job of making this more easily accessible and easier to get to. Um, I think on the main MLA page, if you go under the tab for advocacy, which is in the center, um, this is underneath there. So it's super easy to get to. It's one nice page of everything listed out. Um, lots of good stuff in there. So that's essentially what I have for you. I like to make this about 45 minutes and then have some time for questions. Um, you can contact me at any time. Send me an email or call me. Um, and I'm happy to discuss things with you. If you have questions about things that I brought up today or you think about something later, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. I, I really want to do what I can to help you um, or throw some ideas around. You know, if you've done something that's been really successful, please, please, please tell me about it. Share it with me um, so that I can tell other people, of course, um, but I can keep it in mind for when I finally get my site up and running um, and contact you about having things shared there and so forth. So um, thank you very much for your participation today and for being here. and. I'll answer any questions that I can. And feel free to unmute yourself to ask your questions, or you can type them into the chat box.
I had never heard of the Six Sigma project, but I really like the idea of that. Yeah, it's, um, it, like I said, it's big in healthcare now. It started out actually in the automotive industry, I think, um, and lean definitely came out of the uh, Japanese motor industry, I think, and um, it, it works very well in healthcare. Um, so whoever, you know, years ago decided to bring it into what we're doing was very smart because it, it makes a lot of difference. Yeah, that seems great, and I hadn't thought about applying that to the email process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, um, I, like I said, my inbox is way better than it used to be, but boy, was that something I um, struggle with. There's <laughs> actually a booklet. It's not a booklet. It's a small book. It's called the um, Pocket Six Sigma Toolbook, and um, it's not too big. It's very easy to navigate, but it goes over a lot of ideas and explains basically what Six Sigma is about. Um, so I'd encourage you to pick that up or interlibrary loan it or whatever and take a look at it because it's a really good book and it's not scary or overwhelming. Um, there's other actually in the, um, the For Dummies series, there's Lean Six Sigma for Dummies books also. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. <laughs> So which is a really nice thing because even after I took the course, I you know it's overwhelming. There's a lot of information. So um, I'm yeah I got one of the dummies books from the public library and it was able to break things down for me a bit that I wasn't able to fully understand in the class. So um, well, that's right that. up my alley. <laughs> I love to simplify things wherever I can. <laughs> Yeah, I was very, and this is Mary Carroll, and I was very interested in that too, and I just did some Googling, <laughs> Googling, wondering if other types of organizations, i.e. libraries, were using Lean Six Sigma, um, and I came across an entire um, city that is using Lean Six Sigma out in California, and so the public library is part of that process because I'm always looking for new things to bring to, uh, we're a multi-type library organization, so what are some of the sectors of members doing and types of libraries that might have wider benefit? What's the, um, what is the site that you found that on Mary Carol? Can you let me know so I can look at it? Yeah. Um, it's the city of um, Tulare in California, and uh, initially I went to the Tulare Public Library. So it's T U L. Well, actually, I can just type this into the um, <laughs> into the chat box, can I? Um, let's see. Yeah, Tulare Public Library. Okay, well, we can um, Google they, it as long as... Yeah, they know. mentioned the um, Lean for Dummies and Six Sigma for Dummies and Lean Six Sigma Demystified that they have in their own book collection. It's You know, I think with... Um, um, I mean, I, I'm not being paid by them, but they probably should pay me because I'm one of their biggest, <laughs> biggest supporters that, you know, with what we're having to do and what we're facing now with the changes in healthcare in hospitals, we don't have a choice but to apply these types of principles. Right. You know, I mean, it works. It works very well. Um, so I'm glad that you found that and that there are other... Um, I have looked in medical literature and I haven't found a whole lot, um, you know, doing PubMed search and whatever, um, but I... Beyond that, I haven't taken a lot of time to look further. So this is helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Are there any other questions for Heather? Well, I'll just say one more thing, <laughs> not to um, fixate on Lean Six Sigma, but um, a group of us are working with an assessment initiative within New York State. And so I somehow, and maybe as I learn more about Lean Six Sigma, I will see how that might all fit together or be a tool or something, something. Yeah, I think you'll find benefit 
I do. And maybe talk with some of the other colleagues that you're part of that um, you know, team with and see if any of them have it within their institutions um, and maybe are already applying it in some way but they haven't thought to bring it to this, this uh, group thing that you're working on. Okay, great idea. Well, thank you, Heather, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys Heather. so much for asking me to be here. And um, again, Jessica, thank you for going through the effort of getting the CE available. Um, it's really important to many of us. So um, sure, yes, yeah, and we'll be sending out the evaluation and the MLA certificates later this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.